This brings us to Adrian, um, also from the Space Telescope Science Institute. Adrian Lucy will talk about archival data retrieval and analysis in the time domain. Speak, friend, and enter. Hi. Um, so my job at my new job at Space Telescope Science Institute is 50% um, science um, and 50% um, functional support for the MAST archive, as well as an additional 20% of figuring out how my new computer works. Um, and um, apparently. Um, and um, uh, this talk will sort of try to reflect that um, balance, um, that attempted balance. Um, so time that I would usually spend talking about um, the science of my uh, recent uh, uh, dissertation, um, I will instead uh, spend on a somewhat granular walkthrough of some of the data retrieval decisions that I made along the way and, and why I made them. Uh, and then towards the end, I'll talk about the Master Archive's ecosystem of data retrieval options and, and how that might look for Roman uh, with an emphasis on might. Um, and so this will all be sort of fairly anecdotal. Uh, there's no like giant flow, flow chart that I can show telling you like what to do. And, and I think that that's a reflection uh, possibly of how my brain works, but also of how um, trying to do complicated things with mass, with, with, with just archives in general works. Um, there's a lot of um, troubleshooting. Um, but let's start with the science. So a symbiotic star is a binary comprised of a cool giant accreting onto a usually a white dwarf. Um, you have a, an accretion disk um, around the white dwarf very often. Um, and sometimes you can have nuclear burning on the surface of the white dwarf if things are just right. Um, and the accretion disk, and possibly with the addition of the, the burning white dwarf, uh, illuminates the dense wind nebula of the mass losing red giant. Um, and so you get a spectrum that looks like bright emission lines on top of what otherwise can very often look like just a red giant because red giants are so bright and can obscure a lot of the accretion disk signatures. But we are interested in the accretion disk signatures, the kind of thing that you can get with uh, cataclysmic variables and, um, uh, and, and, and other accreting systems where red giants and nuclear burning are less of a problem. Um, uh, so for, in particular, um, I'm interested in accretion disk optical flickering, um, which is a superposition of multiplicatively uh, coupled fluctuations in the flux um, with long time scale variability um, in the most popular model, uh, pink noise in the mass transfer rate through the outer accretion disk propagating inwards, building on top of itself uh, as it goes to higher frequencies and getting damped into red noise in the inner disk. It's not really well understood, but it seems to be a universal property of accretion from young stellar objects to quasars, and it, 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 it goes on slower time scales uh, as the um, uh, the accretion mass increases or as the disk size increases. Um, and, but, but, but things can prevent you from seeing flickering, um, in particular the cool giant being really luminous and dominating the flux because the cool giant is, it, is not flickering. Um, there can be no accretion disk at all if you have sort of spherical accretion because you have um, this wind from the red giant and sometimes that's how the mass transfer is proceeding. Um, and especially you can have shell burning that overwhelms the flickering. Um, and so in the, the parameter space of accretion rate and white dwarf mass, and uh, also like things like um, time since last Nova eruption, um, uh, th there's, there's a fairly now a range of parameter space where uh, burning happens, but those are the symbiotic stars that are most easy to find because they have these bright emission lines that make them very clear. Um, uh, bright and high ionization emission lines that distinguish themselves very well from uh, ordinary giants, which can have uh, emission lines on their own sometimes of low ionization, like um, H alpha and stuff, um, or like the whole Baumler series. Um, and so uh, uh, perhaps because of this, there are only about 10 or 11 known optically flickering symbiotics with directly detectable optical accretion disk flickering from the disk, or at least. There were only 10 or 11 before 2021, um, before uh, my group and also um, our uh, uh, competing, uh, uh, competing group, uh, quote unquote, um, uh, uh, Yulissa Minari, who's doing wonderful work as well. Um, uh, and so we decided to try to select, uh, unlike prior surveys, uh, select actively for direct accretion disk signatures and in particular for flickering. Um, and so we used the SkyMapper Southern Sky Survey um, which uh, has a Stromgen U band, a, a Violet V band, and those are particularly useful because um, uh, 
uh, symbiotic stars uh, can just look like cool giants, as I mentioned, on the red end. But as you go to the blue end, where the cool giant is dimmer, uh, the accretion disk can slowly start to dominate a little. Um, and so the, these, uh, these, these filters are particularly useful. That V is not the SDS, the SDS SV, that, that's a violet filter. Um, and there's also time domain information in the SkyMapper uh, survey. Every time that SkyMapper hits a field um, in the main survey, which it does um, uh, at least two times, ultimately, um, it observes a filter sequence in the space of 20 minutes. So it goes like this, UVGR, UVIZ, UV. Um, so there are three exposures in the U band, for example, the bluest band, which we're interested in, um, uh, that are separated by eight minutes. So there's U, U, U exposure and then eight minutes and then another U exposure and then eight minutes and then another U exposure. Um, and so it's only three data points, but we were, we, we were hopeful that we could find, um, uh, that we could select for uh, accretion disk filtering and find new symbiotic stars um, that are accreting only without nuclear burning and with detect directly detectable uh, accretion disk signatures. Um, and so here's we, where we get sort of into the granularity um, of uh, a talk that is really more about archives um, and data retrieval than it is about that science. Um, so the first thing that we do um, is we build a sample of luminous red objects. Uh, what we really want is a sample of cool giants, of red giants, to select uh, symbiotic stars from in SkyMapper parameter space. Uh, but there's going to be contaminants, so we call it a um, sample of... Uh, I lost the volume. Objects. Can anybody confirm that it's me? Uh, just you, Fed. We can hear you. No, Adrian? Uh, it sounds like someone said that they can hear me, right? Yes, we can, Adrian. We're good. Okay. I'm so I think it is just, head. Head. just go ahead. Cool. Um, I'll proceed. Uh, th thank you for checking in. Now. Um, uh, and so um, uh, to build the sample of red giants, basically, um, we do a few things. Um, so we're going to do an infrared uh, color cut. Um, we're going to do an infrared luminosity cut. Um, we're going to keep the infrared color cut very simple because we don't want to select against what may be unusual infrared properties of symbiotic stars. So we don't want to do like these multiple color cuts that people doing um, galactic dynamics do when they're selecting infrared giants. Um, and um, a, variety, a variety of uh, quality control cuts, um, like no other sky map resource within six arc seconds. Um, uh, other things, um, we need a Baylor-Jones uh, uh, Bayesian uh, distance from Gaia DR2 in order to make the luminosity cut. Um, more quality control cuts that are just based on a detailed reading of the requirements of the different surveys, like TUMAS and SkyMapper, um, and likewise cross matches that are based on a detailed reading of, of those surveys and picking the larger of the, the two that are being paired together. Um, uh, larger cross ma matching radius, I mean. Um, and I'll get to, into this later, but we also need sufficient data to reconstruct a nightly color snapshot um, from individual sky map measurements. And I'll talk about why that is the case and how we do that. Um, but first, the infrared color cut. The reason that we do that is basically uh, just to cut off the uh, uh, um, main, the, 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 the HR diagrams that were just over here in the HR diagram so that the uh, a luminosity cut doesn't have to be too specific. It can just be anywhere. It doesn't have to be like a function of the temperature. Um, it can, it, and we can very easily with the luminosity cut from Gaia and two mass separate giants and the main sequence. Um, and that's what we're showing here with a test on rave stars, which have um, from the, the uh, narrow band spectra, have temperatures and, um, and uh, uh, surface gravities. Um, uh, th there's this sort of, if you don't do an infrared color cut, it, th there's a sort of ambiguity of subgiants, which are coming off the main sequence, um, which we don't want to have to deal with. We just want giants. Um, and so we do the loosest cut that we can do while uh, cutting out those warm subgiants. And I did say it would be granular. So here um, is what we're doing for our ADQL query in uh, TopCat. ADQL is a variant of SQL or SQL, um, uh, which is a um, way to retrieve data from relational databases. Um, uh, it, um, ADQL is like sort of an astronomy um, wrapper for that. Um, uh, 
the the Topcat is just a um, an application um, in which you can do a lot of um, you can you can do that and you can do related things um, and to, to various tap endpoints um, and it has a very creepy logo that um, makes you very unsettled like the cat from uh, Alice in Wonderland but somehow worse um, and so uh, you um, uh, first we uh, select a variety of um, columns that are chosen from the um, schema um, uh, of, of SkyMapper and various databases that we're joining SkyMapper to. Um, so we're selecting from the SkyMapper master catalog. We're doing an inner join with, so, so it, it, we must have a value for both, um, both databases, uh, Tatumas and Gaia. Um, and we're doing, uh, and those are pre-matched in SkyMapper, so that's convenient. Um, uh, but there's no pre-match, there, there's no Baylor-Jones uh, Bayesian distances from the idea to in this, or there weren't at the time in, in the SkyMapper schema. Um, so we'll have to deal with that later and we don't make a distance cut right now. Um, uh, so we do the cross-matching radii, we um, uh, do various quality control things like um, how much it looks like a star and whether there's something nearby it that could mess up the photometry. We tested first um, on, uh, symbiotic stars with extended nebulae that could um, uh, mess things up, uh, but found that these were fine for that. All, all of the symbiotics with extended nebulae didn't, didn't mind having the two mass extension key being null, for example, um, being restricted to null, I mean. Um, but we did actually have to, um, we found like uh, sort of additional sources in the wings of um, uh, the two mass photometry. So we didn't do a two mass for, uh, proximity constraint. We only did sky mapper. Um, and so that's sort of what one lesson that you, you sort of have to test as you're going along in incrementally. Um, and um, uh, we ran this query asynchronously um, because um, there were uh, a, a lot of output and it was a complicated query. So we um, didn't want to uh, dominate the, um, the server. Um, uh, so we wanted to let uh, other queries go through while, while ours was waiting. Um, and um, then we have this problem where the Baylor-Jones distances are not in SkyMapper. Um, and, uh, but there's a pretty simple solution to that be because um, there's a tap endpoint for Gaia that um, we found that accepted table uploads. So we just did the selection from this, the output um, of this, um, and then uploaded that catalog to, um, to query to, and cross-matched it to uh, uh, the Baylor-Jones catalog through a particular endpoint that allowed for uh, sufficient um, cross-matching of local tables, uh, table uploads, quote unquote, is the keyword to look for if you need that functionality. Um, and um, we sped it up by retrieving only indexed columns. Um, that just means that there's a, a, like a fast lookup table in the relational uh, database structure. Um, that, that, that's a very um, quick summary of what that means, but because um, uh, uh, otherwise it, it, it would, uh, the, the, the process would time out. Um, and there were only, uh, uh, and, and, and then we tested, uh, validated to make sure that this was all working and it was. Um, but there's a couple of problems. First of all, we don't just need the photometry from the master catalog. We need all of the measurements, at least in the U-band for, um, uh, for, for the variability that we're interested in. And there's also another problem, which is that if we plot in this color color space that we ended up being interested in through iter an iterative process uh, if U minus G versus U minus V in SkyMapper, uh, this is our uh, sample and on the color scale um, of, of luminous um, red objects. Um, Myra variables, which are these strong pulsators, um, are scattered all around this color color diagram. Um, uh, on the left here. This is with what you get if you use the master catalog colors um, uh, because they're so strongly variable and because although SkyMapper's survey is sort of nominally symmetric in uh, filters, uh, like it, every observation in one filter tends to have another observation in the other filter of interest, um, sometimes through the pipeline of SkyMapper, um, some of the 
uh, measurements are thrown out and they're not thrown out in a way that's symmetric between different filters. Um, and so you get colors that are not snapshot colors. They're colors that where one filter was observed at one time and another filter, the, the average time was quite distant, when, when distant uh, at a time when the pulsation of the Mira was at a very different point. And so we need to get variability and, and, and recalculate colors from the full photometry table of individual measurements. We want to get snapshot colors from those individual measurements. Um, we didn't want to retrieve individual measurements for millions of M dwarfs, so we need to incorporate distances into the selection. Um, and SkyMapper didn't have Baylor Jones distances in the, the, in the schema, um, as I mentioned before. And the SkyMapper tap endpoint doesn't accept table uploads. So we were sort of in this complicated space where we needed some kind of workaround. Um, and oops. and um, the, our solution was to do a um, multi-cone search, um, uh, give me one second. Uh, cross matching our sample to the SkyMapper DR2 uh, photometry tap cone search endpoint with the right outer join. And so we just used a sort of different function functionality of SkyMapper's database, um, which we uh, had figured out that we might need um, uh, months earlier during a, during a workshop. Um, and we uh, separated the query into pieces to avoid timing out the multi-clone query. Um, and, and, and then we downloaded all those individual photometry measurements and, and concatenated the tables. And then we downloaded the full table of images um, which had additional metadata that we needed. Uh, the date of observation was not in the photometry table. It was only available by matching the index in the photometry table to uh, an index in the image table. And we joined those um, locally in TopCat. And we did some quality control cuts. And then we computed for each object a weighted average of nightly U minus V and U minus G colors in pandas. And, um, and, and all the Myras in this fixed reconstructed colors are very well localized. Um, and so, um, uh, so, so th there we have our, our color color space that we've built, um, and we have a, a variability space that we. Uh, I'll, I'll skip over this a little bit, um, but we, but the, we, as I mentioned, we have all the U band individual measurements now, and so we just do a metric of um, the the uh, amplitude of the variability within those three measurements of a main survey filter sequence. And, and plotted as a function of the U-band flux. Um, uh, we can also do a SIMBAD cross-match. This is an another um, useful functionality of TopCat um, to, with using CDS upload X-match um, and to see that um, symbiotics are pretty well localized even in just color-color space, although not completely well localized. And uh, to skip through the science a little bit, uh, but to just mention briefly, um, we found 12 confirmed symbiotics um, and an additional 10 candidates. And most excitingly, um, uh, uh, through, through follow-up uh, uh, spectroscopy, um, and most excitingly, uh, we found uh, optically flickering symbiotics um, uh, confirmed here through follow-up less converse observatory light curves on uh, candidates detected through, um, uh, uh, through our SkyMapper selection. Um, and um, we found that at least 20% of the true population of symbiotics will have optical flickering from the accretion disk detectable through SkyMapper, um, which is at least several times what would, would, would have been expected before um, based on prior searches. Um, so there, there are some questions that you might want to ask yourself. Um, and again, this is anecdotal, but um, that, that, that when, you're, when you're doing a, uh, uh, this kind of archival retrieval, retrieval work, what data do I need for my science to work? Obviously, um, but but just like keep in mind your goal the whole time um, and don't give up unless you really have to. Um, how many output output rows do I expect? Is there a limit to how many output rows the um, the service uh, can handle? Um, how much data do I want to download? Can I download that much data? Do I have the um, internet to be able to handle that? Do I have the space on my computer? Can I split it into parts if I'm timing out the service? Um, uh, is it a big um, is it a big query that needs to be done asynchronously? Um, 
what do the database schema look like and, and what is indexed so that you know what would be faster if, if you can just get away with just using indexed um, columns. Um, do I need to cross match to external catalogs? What external data is already available in the schema or through the interface that I'm using and what uh, needs to be uh, accessed through other means? Um, do I wanna be able to uh, cross match to local tables? Um, uh, so do I need table uploads? Um, and most importantly, what is the email address of the archives help desk? Because um, that I think is the most important thing to be able to ask for help um, quite early in the process if you can. Um, and so um, now I'll transition to talking a little bit uh, in my last few minutes about the MAST ecosystem. Uh, and I wanna just disclaimer here that um, I started in October uh, I am not speaking on uh, behalf of MAST or cer and certainly not speaking on behalf of the, the, the Roman uh, team in, in MAST. Um, uh, I, I am just, these are just sort of anecdote, anecdotal impressions of the ecosystem of MAST um, and you should take them with a grain of salt. Um, so you have a few options. Um, and all of these things in, by 2026, when Roman launches, will be uh, so, somewhat different and improved. Um, you have the portal in, uh, in a browser um, uh, where you can explore data um, uh, if you don't know exactly what you're looking for. Um, the portal, because that needs to be, uh, the, the main aspect of the portal needs to be cross-mission. Um, uh, uh, does not have access to all the metadata that all missions have, because when you need to merge missions into a common model of observations in the archive, you're going to have to cut some metadata out that doesn't map onto the model, that doesn't um, synchronize across missions. Um, and so sometimes you need the individual, you, you might want the individual mission search forms um, on our old website, and eventually the, there'll be sort of an easier way um, uh, in a few years, uh, hopefully, um, to transition between um, the two. Um, there's also high level science products, um, which is the main thing that I work on, ingesting those and making them more discoverable. Um, and those are um, uh, uh, observations catalogs or, or, or models uh, that, that, that complement or are derived from mass supported missions. Um, so it's like high level products that um, are like, any, anything um, that you think might be helpful um, to uh, other users that's uh, not just the original observations that are already in mass, um, you can uh, contribute um, to our uh, to, to mass and, and we have a process for ingesting those. Um, and so uh, we're, we're going to work on making um, the science content of all this much more discoverable, but like looking at object types and product types. At the moment, these columns are not really too helpful, um, but we're going to work a lot about it on, on tagging uh, these data in more interesting ways. Um, and um, uh, and there's also some like individual uh, HLSP uh, categories that have their own sort of websites. Um, um, and and so before I continue, let me just say like. This is a complex ecosystem, but if you just need something simple, just go to the portal and get like you know the observation for the objects that you need. Um, and if you need something simple that's programmatic, um, uh, here I'll talk about programmatic interfaces. Uh, there's Astro Query um, uh, in MAST, which is uh, in Python. It has extensive functionality, although it can't access all the metadata. Uh, it has a row, output row limits for some things, but it's it's very nice and and, and it's um, and it's Pythonic, um, and so that should probably be your default for programmatic interfaces. Um, how am I doing on time? I sort of lost track. Yeah, I just the I just reveal my camera to tell you that you're out of time, but you have a couple more minutes to catch up on the time that we lost at the beginning. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, uh, so. Um, uh, th thank you so much for the extra time. Um, uh, if you need more access to um, metadata, there's the MAST API or the Mashup API, um, uh, which is more complex. Um, it still has a row output limit of about 500,000. Um, it has access to more, but not all metadata. Um, there's also, you can also do HTTP GET requests, um, sort of similar to that. Um, you can also um, 
do a tap query to the common observation model, uh, common archive observation model, um, which has all of the cross mission uh, uh, metadata in the cross mission model. Um, uh, virtual observatory compatible, um, it can handle ADQL queries, it can handle large asynchronous queries. Um, uh, if you need to cross match to other archives and the portal uh, shows that the data you need is available for um, virtual observ observatory service, um, which uh, I'll just gloss over uh, since I'm running out of time, um, the virtual observatory tap endpoints exist also. Um, if you have a very large complex query with like more than a million, at least like a million output rows, um, and or you need to upload your own very large table for a cross match, um, your data may be available in cast jobs, um, which can handle SQL queries. Um, it can handle larger asynchronous queries. Um, it contains a, a bunch of high level science products. It contains Kepler to, uh, tests and two mass and pan stars data, et cetera. Um, and finally, uh, uh, very important for Roman, um, there will be um, cloud interfaces um, like Tyke is Tyke is the cloud interface is a is a science pl platform which has cloud capabilities for tests and it's a very good appro approximation of what the Roman science platform will look like um, and so if you are doing something like um, you you want to um, uh, select um, uh, categorize red giants into different um, uh, uh, categories by their pulsation properties, um, because you think that says something about their uh, outflow properties, which could affect the uh, accretion mass transfer pro uh, 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 mechanism, um, then uh, you might want to reduce uh, all the light curves yourself, for example, maybe in, in the cloud. You don't want to download uh, like 500,000 red giants, all of their images. So you might want to do that in the cloud um, uh, so that you're not having to download uh, all of that data. Um, Adrian, and, thank and that'll you. be important for a moment. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop you there just to have um, space to read one comment. I have a question, but I don't have to ask it. If somebody else poses a question on chat or on Slack, the comment is from Gisela um, De Rosa, who comments that SDSEI on Roma, uh, on the Roman support, um, the offer will be different for Roman products. Catalog the high level product will be offered as well as science platform. Stay tuned. If you have any questions, you can Slack Gisela or Harry Ferguson. And since I don't see a question and we have two more minutes, um, once one thing, it might be, uh, it, it might not exactly be a question in the sense that I don't exactly expect an answer, but you know, Rubin is also building its own science platform and there was in the decadal encouragement to coordinate um, data retrieval and science platform and catalogs. And so can we expect that some work on that front in coordination between Roman and Rubin and more generally between NASA and NSF facilities will happen in the next? years? I assume so, but that's beyond the scope of my knowledge. <laughs> um, I, I will respond to um, Probably Bobby Giselle's comments. That, sorry, I, I'll, I'll just respond to Giselle, Giselle's comment that, um, yes, absolutely, um, these things uh, will be different uh, for Roman. And, 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 um, uh, uh, the, the, and, and also, it'll be different, not just specifically because of Roman, but also because MAST as a whole will be different in 2026. Um, so the portal will look different. Um, we'll have sort of a better transition between the um, uh, cross mission and the individual mission uh, access to metadata. Um, uh, and, uh, and yeah, it, it is certainly true that the science platform will be um, different. Um, uh, but uh, I, talking to the makers of, of Tyke at least, um, uh, and but not speaking for the Roman team, but just talking to the makers of Tyke, they, they definitely think that um, Tyke is a is a reasonable or at least best current available approximation for what the Roman science platform might look like in in many respects um, in, in terms of its cloud capabilities. Um, and so, 
it, it might be a useful thing to experiment with if you are um, interested in, in Roman data. Very fair. Thank you very much, Adrian. Let's thank Adrian with a round of virtual applauses.